I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Kevin Reel, lecturer in intelligence and international security at Brunel University in London. Dr. Reel literally wrote the book on Russian intelligence, along with the definitive book on Soviet defectors, as well as dozens of papers on Russian espionage, spycraft, military strategy, and Cold War history. Dr. Reel's history includes over 30 years of experience in intelligence and counterintelligence roles with the Defense Intelligence Agency, U.S. European Command, and the FBI, culminating in the position of Senior Policy Officer at the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Dr. Reel has a BA in Russian and Political Science from Brigham Young University, an MS in Strategic Intelligence from the Joint Military Intelligence College, and a PhD in War Studies from King's College London, as well as a diploma from the Command and Staff College at the U.S. Naval War College. He is also the recipient of numerous awards and honors. So, Kevin, welcome back. It is a a pleasure and an honor. I want to thank you for your career of service before anything else. You have done so much for our nation. My pleasure. Our focus today is on your upcoming book, The Russian FSB, A Concise History of the Federal Security Service, which is now available for pre-order through the Georgetown University Press. Uh, this is a topic that you've written about at length in past books and papers. So let me start by asking, what inspired you to write this book? What makes it unique? And who should be reading this? This book began when the Georgetown University Press uh, announced that it was it was um, going to be sponsoring a series of books on foreign intelligence organizations, foreign intelligence and security organizations. And uh, when I learned about that, I learned that that FSB was going to be one of the agencies that it was going to cover. These are intended to be short reference books for anyone who's interested in intelligence or security, or frankly, in, in the politics of the countries that are being covered. Anyone who is interested in Russian politics um, should be interested in the FSB as it is a major force in Russian, the Russian political system. And so anyone who would be involved in, in that would probably find this interesting. But it really began with the, uh, the, the Georgetown University, University Press's series that should be, and this will be the first in that series, it'll be published in about March of next year. Ah. Okay. Well, before we get into this further, I want to point people towards the dozens of books and papers that you've already written on Russian intelligence and spycraft, which are available through your website at kevinreal.academia.edu. I'm going to drop some links in there, and I would urge people to visit that. You have such an incredible wealth of material that you've already written. I've used some of this for past interviews. We've discussed Russian intelligence, a case-based study of Russian services, missions past and present, as well as Russia's war in Ukraine. Those were both excellent analysis pieces. So thank you for putting that out there for people. Again, I'm going to put the links in the show notes. Do you have any recommendations for past work that people should start with? Well, um, just this morning, literally, a new uh, article appeared in the International Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence that discusses the expulsions of Russian officers from embassies and Russian government organizations during the Cold War and then compares that with expulsions that have occurred since the Cold War and how they've looked different or how they've looked similar. And so I, that, that is a very recent piece that has just been added. I just, just today added to that academia site. So I'd encourage people to look at that. Um, it, it is one that shows some continuity with Cold War history, as well as some, some differences as well. Okay. Well, so again, your new book, we're focused on the FSB, which is the Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation. Now, I've done a little bit of research on this and to just kind of bring myself up to speed. This is described as the internal security agency for Russia. It was created in 1985 from the Federal Counterintelligence Service, which was in turn created from parts of the old Soviet KGB in 1993. 
Now, from what I understand, this is supposed to be focused on internal security matters such as counterintelligence. Is is that fairly accurate? That internal security and law enforcement are the FSB's primary functions. It looks at counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and it has also a number of criminal violations that it investigates um, uh, economic crimes, uh, even environmental crimes. So it is heavily focused on internal security and law enforcement. However, it does have foreign intelligence roles, particularly in the former Soviet states, but also in the FSB's capability to monitor communications that cross the, Russia's uh, networks. It has also the ability to listen to, tra to transnational co um, uh, communications as well. It also has computer-based uh, collection capabilities that that extend globally just in, in Russia. So it has a global reach in its intelligence functions, and uh, in addition to that that heavy internal security function. Ah, okay. Well, I I guess my views of this have been a little bit clouded by Hollywood, and I think all of ours have, and that's why I'm trying to try and clarify a little bit. It's the reason that I'd stressed internal is again when I was looking things up, it says the three major structural successor components of the former KGB have remained independent of the FSB. So the Foreign Intelligence Service handles external mm -hmm. intelligence. The Federal Protective Service uh, protects high-ranking officials, which to me reminds me a little bit of the Secret Service in the US. And then there's something called the Main Directorate of Special Programs of the President of the Russian Federation, which is basically focused on mobilization and mobilization training. And so those, so basically it sounds like when the KGB was split up, not everything transitioned into the FSB. They they broke it up into different services. That's correct. In fact, initially, even there were even more uh, separate services in the 1990s. Um, in addition to the ones you just mentioned, uh, there was also something called the Federal Agency for Government uh, Communications and Information, or FAPSI, and its Russian acronym, that was created in 1994, and it was essentially Russia's signals, intelligence, and information security agency for about 10 years, and it had come from the KGB as well. And then there was also the Federal Border Service, which had also come from the KGB during the Soviet era. Those were independent of the FSB and of the other agencies you mentioned until about 2003, 2004, when much of them were folded back into the FSB. So the FSB was one among several agencies in the 1990s that were heirs to the KGB. Uh, but by about 2004, a lot of those pieces had been reaccumulated back under the FSB against the FSB. So it has many of the functions of the former KGB, with the exception of those two, those, those two main ones that you mentioned, the Foreign, Foreign Intelligence Service, which is the former first chief directorate of the KGB or the Foreign Intelligence Directorate, and the Federal Protective Service, which has senior leader protection as well as as um, act, activities to basically support the political uh, structure of the president. More than just, it's, it's, it's senior leader security like the Secret Service, but also um, political security for the president as well. So th those are all what are called Czechist organizations or organizations that originated with the the, the KGB, which then, then had its origins in the the, orig the original state security service of the, the, the Bolshevik era, um, the Soviet Union, the Cheka or the Extraordinary Committee, um, they all look back to that Bolshevik era or, um, origin as their foundation. And those are all then in the Russian terminology known as Czechist organizations. Uh, the FSB being by, by far the largest of them, and the most powerful. Ah, well, again, from kind of an American perspective, would it be better to compare this to the CIA or the FBI? And it, the reason I ask is, again, 
that that Hollywood influence there. I tend to think FSB is kind of like the CIA, right? You know, it's the cloak and dagger stuff. But when I was reading about it, especially the law enforcement duties, it did seem much more comparable to the FBI. The FSB is usually compared more with the FBI. However, the FSB has many other functions that the FBI in the United States does not have. There's something that I actually discuss in the book to some extent, that if you were to find equivalent organizations in the U.S. structure, you would have to look to the FBI, but also other de Department of Justice organizations, uh, the, the uh, criminal uh, prosecution organizations in the Department of Justice, you'd have to look to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for organizations like the, um, the Counterterrorism Center, the National Counterterrorism Center, and the the National the the Office for the National Counterintelligence Executive are also functions that fall under the FSB. You'd have to look at the Department of Defense for the uh, military counterintelligence organizations, the Air Force OSI. Uh, National Cr Naval Criminal Investigative Service, the Army CI, those functions in the U.S. that are separate from the FBI all fall under the FSB. You'd even have to go to organizations like the Securities and Exchange Commission and the the or enforcement or organs of the Environmental Protection Agency, all of which also fall under the FSB, the equivalents of those in Russia. So there is really no direct equivalent of the FSB in the U.S. structure or any other country's structure for that matter, because it has all of those authorities under one organization. A lot of diverse roles. Now, one of the major roles for the FSB has been anti-terrorist operations, beginning with the Moscow theater hostage crisis in 2002. And they worked there with Spetsnaz units to rescue hostages. From what I recall, they were pretty criticized about the casualties that were incurred there. But by 2008, they had refined this to the point where the American Carnegie Endowment's foreign policy magazine named Russia as the quote unquote worst place to be a terrorist in the world. So this is kind of an open above board federal law enforcement part of their duties, right? It is. And it's something that the Russian, the, the Russian government, the FSB talk about a lot. There's actually something called the, uh, the National Anti-Terrorism Committee, which is an organization under the FSB um, that is essentially the counterterrorism policy arm of the Russian government. And that is uh, run by a, a, a senior officer within the FSB. The the, you mentioned that the, the Spetsnaz began with the theater crisis in 2002. Well, the, the Spetsnaz of the FSB actually began during the Soviet era. Uh -huh. when And they were initially formed for counterterrorism, one of them for counterterrorism purposes, and the other for external surveillance purposes, for, for um, monitoring uh, undesirables outside the Russian government, outside the Russian territory. So they're called Alpha and Vimpel, or Director A and Director V. And those are um, FSB organizations today. They had their subordination has, has uh, go, gone back and forth a little bit since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but today they're under the FSB. And they are basically counterterrorism operational organizations. And they were heavily involved since the Soviet Union in Chechnya. And there were a number of of those FSB special operations forces that were heavily involved in uh, counterterrorism operations in Chechnya, but then also those very prominent ones, such as the, the Moscow theater hostage situation, but then also situations in the Caucasus, such as the Beslan school siege and, 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 and things like that. And they, they have been somewhat criticized because when they resolve those situations, they do so with somewhat of a, with a pretty heavy hand. In the theater siege in 2002 in Moscow, the, the it was a case where some Chechen terrorists did take uh, several hundred civilians hostage inside a theater. And the one of the, the method that was used to to essentially disarm the terrorists was to pump a, uh, a, a gas, a, um, 
a, a kind of a sleeping gas into the theater with the purpose of basically incapacitating the terrorists and then storming the theater to disarm them and, to, and, and arrest them. But in the process of pumping that gas into the theater, they also sickened and even killed several of the hostages. Mm -hmm. And that is something that the, uh, the Russian counterterrorism forces have been known for is, as you the, the quote that you mentioned, it's the worst place to be a terrorist, but it's also not a good place to be a terrorist um, hostage. Because if you're a terrorist hostage, there's a chance that you might be harmed in the process of those terrorists being prosecuted as well. So that's the criticism the, that the FSB has gotten from that is to a great extent because the hostages, often uh, children or or um, civilians who had nothing to do with the terrorism operation, have been harmed in the, as well, alongside the terrorists. So it's it is a a pretty uh, act aggressive organization that uses very aggressive tactics. Okay. Well, so I, I want to change focus a little bit because in the past, you have talked about Russian intelligence in general using what's called, I believe it's agents provocateurs. And I've heard that the FSB was involved with preparations for the Russian annex of the Crimea Peninsula in 2014. And of course, they're playing some kind of a continuing role in the Ukraine conflict as well. Uh, in fact, the BBC cited the FSB as taking a lead role on intelligence and influence operations ahead of both the SVR and the GRU, which are the Foreign and Military Intelligence Services. So is that something that they are also involved with to this day? And and do you think that they took the lead role because of Ukraine's proximity to Russia? They take the lead role because the former Soviet states still to fall within what the Russian government conceptually sees as domestic territory. And thus the FSB is the primary intelligence organ that operates within the former Soviet space. That includes the cent Central Asian states, Caucasus states, uh, and Ukraine as well. So the FSB is a major player in the Ukraine war today. Um, the arrests that Ukraine, Ukrainian uh, State Security Service has made of, of uh, Russian recruited spies within Ukraine have to, uh, to, uh, to vast majority of them been recruited by the F FSB, not by the GRU or the SVR. In fact, the SVR probably operates to a much smaller extent within Ukraine. The GRU does operate in Ukraine and does recruit humans, but also even more so runs technical collection operations such as mm. airborne sensors and those and those sorts of things the fsb is heavily involved in ukraine from a human intelligence perspective um, including collecting very tactical level intelligence about the locations of ukrainian military units the targeting um, specifications for buildings the the plan uh, upcoming plans of the Ukrainian military and the weapons that they're receiving from NATO countries. The FSB is the primary service for collecting that type of information, even though it is well, it is really military intelligence. So within Ukraine, the FSB is the major player. Ah, well, I found a couple of really interesting and very timely tidbits that I wanted to mention. So uh, in 2014, according to a Russian military analyst, the FSB badly misled Putin with claims the Ukrainians would, quote unquote, welcome a Russian invasion of Crimea to free them from the fascists. Uh, according to Radio Free Europe in 2022, the FSB again promised easy victory if Russia invaded Ukraine. So that's that's related to kind of the build up there. And then. Back in October, just a couple of months ago, Newsweek published an article claiming FSB officers had been increasingly sabotaging Putin's orders after there was a federal ban that went into effect to prevent uh, basically all FSB personnel from resigning. So it sounds like, just from reading this, the FSB hasn't been completely aligned with Putin to begin with. 
and maybe they are becoming disenchanted with the direction the war in Ukraine is taking as well. Do you think they have their own agenda? I, I would probably read that a little differently. The, the fact that the FSB did, in fact, um, assess an easy victory in Ukraine is not because they had their own agenda, but because they were trying to cater to Putin's agenda. They were trying to, to give the boss the information he wanted to hear, essentially. And the FSB has an analytic organization they, that, that, is, that, that um, uh, fuses all the information that comes from the FSB's various collection systems around, the, uh, with, around Russia and around the world into a strategic picture for the president. And as you pointed out, that picture leading, particularly leading up to the 2002 invasion, uh, predicted a an easy victory. But it's unclear whether that was what the FSB actually believed themselves, or if that was what they felt the boss needed to hear, or wanted to hear. There is one report, for example, of an FSB officer uh, supposedly phoning up a contact in Kiev just before the invasion began, saying. Uh, I'm going to pick out here's here's the flat I'm going to pick out when I get there because it's going to it's going to you know, it's going to fall really quickly and here's where I want to live when I get there. So there was some overconfidence on the FSB put the FSB's part. Um, there had actually been a poll done of Ukrainians just before the invasion and the FSB was supposedly sponsor of that poll. And it showed a dissatisfied Ukrainian population, a, a re Ukrainian population that that wasn't very happy with its own government. It, it wasn't there. Are, there are a lot of uh, things that that Ukrainians are, are going through even before the invasion began. And so that poll, along with a number of other uh, collection uh, platforms that you that FSB had, gave the FSB the in interpretation that. Ukrainians are going to welcome us. They don't like their government anyway, so we're just going to feed that dislike for their government by calling it fascist, and they'll just fold. But what that estimate did not take into account was, first of all, the resilience of the Ukrainian people, that maybe those polls didn't tell a complete story, but it also didn't tell the story of how the Ukrainians would react differently if they were under threat. And if their country is at risk of, of invasion or is being invaded, then they may, they may respond differently to that poll than they would if the risk wasn't there or if they didn't see the risk as being high. So the FSB had those data points that it analyzed. It put together assessments for the president saying this, was, this is going to be quick and we're going to occupy Kiev in a short amount of time. But there were human factors that they probably didn't take into account that have become much more, uh, much more um, this, uh, prominent since they invaded, and that has then complicated Russia's military operation there. Yeah. Well, and to be honest, this is kind of an aside, but you know, when I was reading through doing research on this. All of the the shortcomings and you know failures that have been illustrated online for the FSB are things that our own intelligence services have been accused of as well, right? So, you know, when I was reading about, for instance, uh, the hostage rescue, that to some degree reminded me of the FBI's handling of Waco, Texas, in the '90s, and you know, so maybe those aren't completely comparable, but I, you know, just from reading through that, I was like, you know what? I can understand how they could have these challenges because we have been accused of having the same ones, right? Like, for instance, the the intelligence gap with the WMDs in Iraq. Yeah, the the difference in Russia. Yeah, that, that certainly there have been times when U.S. and other intelligence services around the world have have not provided the accurate information, but the difference in Russia is that Russia will not publicly acknowledge that. It will always hold up its intelligence and security service publicly as heroic, as the, the saviors of the Russian people. 
there may be behind the scenes discussions about how things didn't go right. But publicly, they, they, those discussions don't happen much. And those who do try to dig into that publicly, such as journalists who try to, to investigate the um, the hostage situation in Russia or in Beslan in the early 2000s, those journalists were were ob obstructed from doing that so uh, that the real situation didn't didn't come to light the difference so the difference in the west is that we actually look very honestly and publicly at our mistakes at the at the areas where we need to improve in russia it's not done publicly at all it's the, the it's it's covered over publicly while in private somebody may figuratively lose his head well I have another very timely question. Uh, I'm wondering if the FSB is involved with the operations in the United States. Last year, Wagner Group founder Evgeny Rogozin admitted to continuing meddling in elections here in the United States. And the way that he had framed it when he described it was he'd said, yes, this is something that has been going on and it will continue to go on. Now, if the Wagner Group as a military contractor is involved with that, do you think that the FSB also is? And is that something that we should be on guard for in the upcoming 2024 elections? The, 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 first of all, the Wagner Group is probably more associated with the GRU or the, that, rather than the FSB. So that particular statement probably referred more to that, to, to that agency, but... The FSB certainly does participate in in uh, foreign uh, active measures or, or foreign measures of support operations, as they're called in Russia, um, to the point where Russia R Russian uh, FSB uh, collection organizations have collected information that has ended up um, leaked for disinformation purposes. So yes, the FSB is involved in that. Uh, the FSB is is a powerful organization around the world. So yes, we need to monitor that. As far as 2024 elections are involved, are, are concerned, uh, I'm sure there is a lot of U.S. government monitoring of that going on right now. But the, the GRU and the SER are probably the main organizations to to uh, participate in that sort of that sort of foreign meddling. But the FSB has capabilities that definitely can support that, um, particularly in the computer-based collection and in the um, use of computers to distribute information around the world. Uh, well, on that note, Kevin, let me thank you so much for your time today. And again, thank you for your tremendous career of service to the United States. Uh, I want to close by asking where we're likely to see uh, Russian intelligence, especially the FSB, in the headlines in the near future? And do you think it'll be related primarily to Ukraine, hopefully not our election process, uh, potentially technology theft, or some other area that we have yet to think of? Well, it, the, the Russian intelligence services, the FSB in, included, have been in the headlines pretty frequently <laughs> over the past couple of years. And in all and all of the things that you just mentioned, the FSB has been directly involved in technology theft, in in supporting efforts to to uh, uh, circumvent sanctions against Russia. So that is something that the the war has has uh, uh, made much more severe for Russia. That it's harder for Russia to to obtain the particular elect electronic components that it needs for its its weapon systems. So the FSB has been involved in those operations. Um, the FSB will continue to be very much involved in Ukraine. And that that is something that is frequently in in the newspapers in your in 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 Ukraine. In particular, um, the Ukrainian press frequently announces the arrests of Russian uh, recruited agents. Uh, so th that's a that's a constant stream of of press reporting but then the one of the things that russia has experienced in the past couple of years is that its own actions have led to 
a greater level of counterintelligence cooperation around the world, particularly between North America and Europe, where those counterintelligence services have been very focused on Russian activities. And that has resulted in a number of, of uh, arrests and expulsions of Russian officers, so, some of which are FSB, most of them are GRU and SVR. But because of that counterintelligence cooperation, which is founded, which is, is prompted by Russia's own actions, Russia's intelligence operations abroad have become more difficult. Kevin, let me thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you.